This is a sermon by Bishop Gregory Brewer of the Episcopal Diocese of Central Florida, July 14, 2013, at Blessed Redeemer Episcopal Church, Palm Bay, Florida. Gracious Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to come into your presence. Thank you that it is because of your strong name and your great salvation that we are able to draw near to you, knowing that you love us, that you receive us, that you forgive us, and that you, as we sang at the beginning, empower us for your service. We yield to your authority and we thank you that we are yours and ask that you would speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I don't know about you, but I've had actually a pretty tumultuous past 24 hours. Um, as many of you are aware, if you've read the diocesan papers or even saw the Sentinel, um, I had the dubious um, honor of having my name on the front page of the Sentinel two days after my consecration. And the reason was is that the purple shirt I was wearing stu stood out in the midst of a group of people that were walking down the streets of Sanford following the shooting of Trayvon Martin. And so, I, like I'm sure many of you, were waiting to hear what would happen in terms of the verdict. And when I heard that George Zimmerman had been found not guilty, I was grieved and still am. And it brings, therefore, for me a new poignancy to the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan. As I uh, tweeted this morning very, very late, uh, I want, I even long to live in a world where George Zimmerman pulled up, rolled down his window, and offered Trayvon Martin a ride home to get him out of the way. That's a very different scenario than the one that we have experienced. And yet, that seems to me what it looks like to live out the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. As we live in a world where that is in fact not how many of us live, it is all the more a challenge for us to read this parable and think carefully and clearly about what it means to live that way. To be the people who are willing to have the courage who were willing to make the sacrifice, who were willing to step into places of difficulty out of nothing more than sheer compassion, not because we're trying to sort of do the right thing and hope other people notice, not because somehow we're trying to gain points with God, but just because God has put something new in our hearts, and it is, in fact, the compassion that he gives us, whom we could relate to socially or not. You see, the temptation in all groups is to line up and act with people who look and act like us, and to be somewhat suspicious of people who do not. The call of the parable of the Good Samaritan is to lay down suspicion and instead ask for God's compassion. And out of that compassion, be willing to step in, even if there is some personal cost. That's what it means to be the Good Samaritan. But I don't know about you, but when I think about that, you know what it does inside of me? I go, oh Lord, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> and that's why we need to really turn to Colossians. Because in Colossians, and in the reading of Colossians, but Paul is describing to this church who themselves are in difficulty. You know, he wouldn't be asking them, I don't know whether you noticed, he talks, where is it, toward the end. He says, may God make you strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power that you may be prepared to endure everything with patience. Now, if life was going well for them, he wouldn't have to talk with them about endurance, would we? You don't need to talk about endurance when things are going well because you're enjoying good circumstances. 
It's only when things are going badly that you need to be talking about endurance with patience, right? On your head. And so he is speaking very realistically to a group of people who are paying a price, a personal price, for their commitment to Christ, and they're living out of that commitment to Christ. And notice what he prays for them, knowing that they have to live in that kind of difficulty. He says, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. You see, if I'm going to live out the Good Samaritan, that's what I, exactly what I need. I need God to give me the strength that comes from his glorious power. And that's actually why we're here. We're here not because we've arrived, because we are people in need. We are here not because we know how to do everything. We might, but we certainly don't know how to actually make it happen in our lives. Most of us, do we not, are in some ways caught between the tension of actually knowing what to do we get, actually, the message of the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's not a new story to most of us. But that is something very different from actually being the Good Samaritan, actually doing what Jesus commands, not merely suggests, but commands we do, which is the implications of the Good Samaritan. You, you know the story. I mean, the Samaritans were not well thought of at all. The kind of racism that is so prevalent in our culture was very much a part of what was going on in those early days of Palestine. Jews wanted nothing to do with Samaritans merely by virtue of their race and their birth. They automatically thought of them as inferior to those who were Jews. And so it is with that point in mind that Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. Not the priest, not the Levite, not the ones that they thought Jesus would make the heroes, the privileged, the best informed, the best educated, the best taken care of. <laughs> they completely failed the test. I, I was so struck. I was doing the parable one time with a group of children, and I told them the story, and I said, okay, now we're going to act it out. And they thought that was terrific. Uh, particularly those who wanted to be the robbers and beat up the Samaritan. They thought that was really fun. But then we have this, they're all, you know, like, they're all eight-year-old boys. Boys like to hit. So anyhow, we, we have this boy laying out. He's the one in need. And I said, okay, the priest walks by. What does he do? And this little boy goes, You don't think I wasn't convicted? <laughs> you see, it's very easy to be selective in our vision, to determine who's in need and who's not, who is worthy of our charity and who is not. But the New Testament standard is much higher than that. He even goes so far as to say, if you've got it, done it under the least of these, brothers, you've done it to me. Come on, this is not easy stuff. You see, our tendency is to minimize the implications so, to re so as to reinforce the rightness of how we are presently living. And therefore, the tough implications that actually might require something more of us than how we are living, we decide not to pay much attention to. And that allows us to turn to Jesus merely for interior emotional comfort, which we know we all need, as opposed to empowerment for ministry and for service. Empowerment means God gives us the ability and the thinking and the opportunity to do things that we would never do on our own. 
I mean, the testimony of people who know this kind of empowerment is real clear. They say, I would never have done this before. But I knew this was what God wanted me to do. And out of that flows a level of sacrifice, of making the time, of sharing the resources, of financially taking care of those in need in a way that may or may not be what I thought I could afford. But God is putting a supply in and through me that I never imagined possible. God is open, opening my eyes to need that I used to just not even notice God is breaking my heart in ways that I never imagined he would. Self-satisfied, oh no, just the opposite. What begins to happen inside of me is I see the need and I cry out to God, God, I need your glorious power, just like it's written in the book of Col Colossians, so that I can be available for you. The need is so large, my strength is so small. And out of that, I begin to discover the truth of what Paul says when he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But even in the midst of giving in ways that certainly feel supernatural, the humility of Jesus always so makes, makes it so clear that if were it not for him, I could do nothing. In other words, I'd still be the comfortable, self-serving church attending so-and-so that I used to be. The people who look great, but in fact give the name of Jesus a very bad name. The priest who blesses the needy and walks away and does virtually nothing. You see, what the Zimmerman verdict teaches me is that is the need of men and women courageous men and women, humble men and women, who are willing to say, in the midst of a society where injustice, in fact, is a part of how we live, I'm still willing to step forward. I'm still willing to give. I'm still willing to do the part that God has for me. I can't do everything, but God, who is my neighbor? Show me where I'm supposed to give, and know that God will, in fact, supply. So that blessed Redeemer is known, just like the Colossian church. I love this line where, where he says, let me find it. You've heard of this hope. The gospel has been coming to you just as it is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. So it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. And he speaks of Epaphras. And he said, he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. In other words, Blessed Redeemer in Palm Bay, known at a as a place for their love in the Spirit, which means God empowering you to care for people in a way that you would not normally. In other words, God empowering you to love in a way that's far beyond cultural preference, that's far beyond, oh, we like you because you're like us. And instead, reach us out in great compassion to one another, regardless of the need, and begins to wrestle together, how can we be that kind of redeeming community in the places where we live? So that your reputation is certainly not of self-satisfied churchgoers but as generous servants whom God is empowering strong, courageous people who step in the gap for those who are in need. Soldiers of Christ, men and women who are willing to be valiant only because of what Christ has done. But because he has done it, we will. With the Spirit's gifts empower us for the work of ministry say. So today, we're celebrating confirmation, where we're celebrating baptism, we're celebrating people being confirmed and received, all of which are signing up to live this very life, the very life that I am describing. It is a public service because we know we need one another to be able to walk like this. It's much harder to do this when you're all by yourself. 
And yet we confirm together that we will serve. We will respect the dignity of every human being. We will love with this kind of compassion. Because that's what we have received in Jesus. So how can we do anything less than that? So, I don't know what you thought might be happening this morning. But it is, in fact, a service of recommitment. On the part of all of us. To say yes to Christ and yes to what he is doing in our midst, in us, and what he desires to do through us for the sake of a very broken world and broken people that he loves so dearly. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer and then we're going to get into baptism and confirmation. Pay attention to the commitments because you are making them this morning. The one caveat, blessedly, is that you will say, I will with God's help because we know we need His help to do what is being asked of us. And so we say yes, but with His help. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you that we are yours and that you were the one who paid attention to us when we were bleeding and on the side of the road. That you sent faithful people to come and draw us to you. That you opened our hearts when we were in rebellion. Didn't want to know anything about you. You opened our hearts to your love and truth. We are debtors, Lord, to your mercy. So allow us, O oh God, to love in the way that you are loving us. Allow us to serve in the way that you are serving us. Allow us to give with the generosity with which you are giving to us. And may we stand with one another in this common commitment. For your sake and for the sake of the world that so desperately needs this love and this mercy. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen. For everyone, whether they